Marc-Antoine, yes, the floor you. is yours. Thank you very much. Just um, to go back on this uh, initial statement, Narendra, you made passionately uh, about this north-south uh, divide and all the obstacles that are related to that. I mean, in a way, you're probably right that uh, a number of concerns in the south are not included and taken on board. But on the other hand, uh, it, it kind of leads to think that, well, you know, if we fail to tackle, you know, the climate change properly, etc., uh, it's because of that divide, and I, and I think that's a little bit of a reduction. To give you a few examples, I think, uh, uh, you know, the the LNG thing that you mentioned is is maybe not not the right example because if you really think it's a south south issue, because actually the Bangladesh Minister of Energy or whatever should have surrounded the Russian ambassador and told him why are you cutting supplies to Germany because. As a consequence of that, we don't get our LNG. Because the fact that the LNG was diverted is fully obeying contracts. It's a contract. There was no violation whatsoever. The, the problem is that the Russians have not fulfilled their contracts. And, and hence, there was no gas in Germany. So the Germans went on the market. It's a market. And if, and if, you, have, if you don't have the market, you don't have the LNG, right? And, and nothing works. And so... So I think there's a lot of South-South issues. I think we have a major issue as far as the South-South issues are related because it's China that dominates the G77 via Pakistan, which is a very strange issue. I mean, China is no more a developing country, but it is recognized as such in the global climate governments, right? So they should pay their part of all the development money, of all the adaptation and mitigation, etc., etc. I, I, I'm sure you, we agree with that. Nothing to do with India, very separate case. Now, is it also a, an issue of governments? You know, for example, uh, you mentioned the IEA. We had all, also this conversation, but since uh, we, we had it, I mean, India has been invited to become a member of the, of the IEA. Well, Yes, yeah, I mean, they're working on changing, they're working on changing the, the treaty establishing the, the IEA. So, and, you know, so, and, and, and in the same organization, there is another uh, of other BRICS countries, say, uh, that, that are there on the table. So, I mean, there is at least this forum, um, which is, no, it's a little bit more than a forum, in a way. Um, now, now, then, of course, there's COP. Now, the point is, I think uh, I, I like the idea of this kind of uh, energy security council. I think that's quite interesting. Now, who would you put in there? Uh, the largest consumers and the largest producers, but then there's nobody in Africa. Um, so then you have to make exceptions, but then all of a sudden you have uh, 100 countries around the table or 80 or 70. And so then what do you do? Do you listen to 70 present? Have you ever attended a, a UN uh, uh, you know, uh, council, uh, um, uh, a national, uh, well, sorry, a general assembly meeting. I mean, it's just insane. You, you three days of presentations <laughs> because every country has, uh, I don't know, five or seven minutes, and then you know you listen to these things. So there's an issue of, okay, how how would that exactly play out, and and then what would it actually be able to do? Because like, would we discuss with the Russians? you know, the gas problems in Europe. So the Russians would say, you know, their narrative, then the Europeans would say, uh, they would start saying, this is an insane aggression, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, after, after two hours, we wouldn't have moved an inch. So the Russians would have said, no, it's the fault of the Europeans. The Europeans would have said, no, it's the fault of, you know. So I think there is this issue of um, not to be underestimated. The big problem of global governance is also the effectiveness to act, right? And we have a chance to have somehow some institutions that somehow work. So maybe, you know, let's try to improve that. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I think this council uh, would make sense perhaps for, for several things. One thing is on oil. Uh, it's interesting, so we are here in one of the largest world's producers, and it's interesting to see that there are fundamental issues on oil that you also find in gas, for example. So, so the issue is, how do, we, how do we ensure a fair redistribution of risks, of you know, profits uh, between the consumer and the, and the off-taker, sorry, and the producer? And, and I think this discussion might come back because we are now, we will somehow, 
you know, have a peak oil demand coming, we can discuss when it's coming, etc. But then we will have to manage, you know, how much investments we still put into the system to avoid the global instability, but still to ensure that we are, you know, on track to A, reduce demand and B, to, you know, align uh, the production, the progressive production reduction with that. So that requires, I think, a good dialogue with the Saudis, with the Emiratis, with the Russians one day when they go back. Um, so that, you know, the oil price is not 130, but not 50. And so that here they can invest in their transition and so that the consumers in India, in Europe, etc., uh, there is no big social unrest and the governments are not destabilized because they all have to focus on the transition and on the stability, right? So I think this we could discuss in such a form. And I think um, another thing is uh, clearly, so what we, do we do with natural gas? And here we could also have, you know, a kind of pathway because now all the emerging economies have been deprived of access to the spot LNG market, right? And as you said, and has been said, they are getting back to core. But, but still, we could discuss a pathway where, okay, you know, what is the 15 years perspective? We know what kind of investments are coming in upstream energy. We know more or less, you know, what could be the demand profile in Europe and Japan and Taiwan and in South Korea and China and the large LNG off takers. And so then we could discuss, you know, what voice could then be progressively possibly freed up again for these countries for, you know, under what terms, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of issues there um, that could be discussed. And, you know, we, we mentioned uh, the electricity systems. I mean, frankly, uh, with the inflation that we have, with the money all going to the U.S., uh, are we realistically going to be able to lay out, you know, all the solar panels that we're talking about, etc.? I doubt, but what is for sure is that, you know, even the numbers and the trajectory on which we are on, that is, 2 trillion investments by 2030 versus 1.2 last year, well, that's still two times less than what is needed for 1.5 degree trajectory. So in any case, we are, we are missing the targets, but then, you know, what are the consequences of failure? The other aspects that could be discussed is, of course, the, the, the clash of industrial policies. I mean, this is an uncooperative world we are entering in. And uh, so there's short-term protectionism, one understands why, but then longer term, you know, of course it will probably slow down some developments or at least increase costs for some and, and what others who have more money might be able to better cope. And then, yes, on the climate governments, I, I, I just would like to, to emphasize the issue that, uh, again, we could discuss in such a format, you know, the need for a carbon price globally. So, you know, in India it might be 20 with a, you know, with a pathway to 50 over 15 years and in the US and Europe, be it a shadow price or real price, we start at 100 and then we move to 150, you know, and, and, and at least that there is a, that there is a, a, a global movement in that sense and I'm, and I'm confident that it can be done. I mean, we have a minimum taxation for large corporations which was negotiation for a very long time. Two years ago, people thought it's impossible, but at the end, it was achieved, right? And, and I'm sure in Russia, we, even in Russia, there were discussions and, you know, stakeholders interested. So it's not impossible. It's not impossible, even for a fossil fuel producing country. And um, yeah, and the last word, of course, uh, that could also discuss everything related to sustainable finance because we can't have 200 definitions of, you know, what is green finance, what is not green finance, what is, you know, in the taxonomy, what is not. So obviously there's a massive need of harmonization here because if I'm a global investor, well, in, in Europe, nuclear, by the way, it's not entirely in the taxonomy, it's under conditions. Uh, same for natural gas, but, you know, in, in, in Japan, there's no discussion about nuclear in the taxonomy, neither in China, neither in Russia. Uh, neither in India, I'm sure, if you put one, but so again, and in the US, of course not, so here, of, of course, also need. Anyway, uh, I'll stop here, but uh, yes, let's take this conversation forward on, the, on, this, uh, on this governance issue. Uh, if I have the, just quickly respond to it, won't take much time. Uh, you see, uh, interesting points, I mean, I, I think this is what's required. We need conversation. It's not that I'm 100% right or you're 100% wrong or you're 100% right or we're 100% wrong. No such thing. We need more conversation around it. For instance, International Energy Agency, you say that India and China have been invited to be, uh, to be members. No, there is no truth in it. India and China, both the giants and the second and the third largest consumer of energy, are been invited to sit outside the room in the lounge. They associate members. 
So you invite somebody, you invite somebody to this conference and say, you can't come in uh, because this is sacrosanct space, go and sit in the lounge. So that's the status. Now, uh, we have to be honest. The fact is that there are many members of IEA, especially the smaller OECD countries, they don't want to change the constitution of IEA. Is the idea of the present chief executive of IEA That means that many of the founding members of IEA don't agree. We also have consultations with them. We also have regular consultations so on IEA. So we need, and moreover, IEA's kind of DNA is what happened in early 1970s in response to the oil embargo from this part of the world. So is DNA is different. To ask any professor who specializes on DNA to change DNA is very, very difficult. It takes generations. Why can't we just create something new? The quick point on this South-South cooperation or the South-South problem, it is not. Because you see, anything that happens, for instance, if we buy LNG from Qatar, you see, A, we pay in dollars. Money has to go via somewhere in the West. Majority of lawyers specializing in international contracts are based in London, New York, and such places. Third, you know, when it comes to technology, LNG technology, is with very limited number of countries. They are and all in the north, actually mostly Germany, Linde and others. So it's actually, it's, it's not really, we can't just say there's south-south, because it's, it's actually both north and south. It is a north-south issue. Now, that's how we need to kind of look at things without being, you know, when I say that we need conversation or not, I'm not accusing anybody. All I'm saying is have conversations, have dialogues. We listen to you, you listen to us, otherwise we are going to create um, thousands of energy Ukraines across the world. Do we, do we want energy Ukraines around the world? Now, final point I just want to make is that when it comes to, you know, uh, when you talked about, uh, you know, these agencies. I, let me give you an example. There is an intergovernmental organization called International Solar Alliance. How many in this room have heard of it? None. Yeah. So International Solar Alliance is an intergovernmental organization. It was anchored by India and France. It's headquartered in India. India has been pushing very hard to kind of make it like the IEA of solar energy. And you know the country which are resisting, supporting, but at the same time resisting. It's a fine art. It's not that easy. You can't say you are resisting. Because I'm a member of International Solar I'm even contributing. But I don't want you to be able to grow. So it's far more complex, my friend. So what we need is honest conversation. That's all I'm saying. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm not saying IEA is bad. All I'm saying is the world has changed, and the world is changing. Gravity Center has moved to our part of the world. This is a new world. If you, the North still kind of is very adamant, they refuse to listen to or even to a conversation, trust me they will regret it in 25 years from now. Thank you very much. Just to, to build on what you said, um, you, you mentioned the Solar Alliance. I think in energy there are um, groups or institutions or association on natural gas, on nuclear and so on. The thing is that it's very often uh, polluted by politics. And you see, it's uh, my experience at the UN, uh, my experience in the private sector, it's very difficult to have a, a honest conversation. And we see that nowadays uh, in Yaz and, and, and many other sectors. Uh, so it's not an easy task. It's an important task to, and, and we have to move forward in this way for sure. Uh, there's uh, uh, one platform that mm, that is interesting, according to me, is the uh, Regional Commission of the UN in Bangkok, ESCAP, where India is a member with all these uh, nations, and they are doing a great job on all these issues. Friedberg, the floor is yours. I'm, I'm a bit skeptic what, what concerns this idea, not because I... I'm against talking and uh, talking between North and South and, and, and of course dialogue is always good. But the best governance for, for energy was a liberal free energy market, uh, not politicized. Uh, well, that has broken down as has 
as, as the whole world has turned more protectionist, uh, more my nation first. Uh, well, Trump said America first, but Mr. Biden is doing pretty much the same. A little bit nicer words, a bit more diplomatic, but the, the core is the same. Uh, and wherever we, we uh, look around in the world, this notion of a multipolar discussing world looking for better governance is pretty much vanishing away. And what we see is more and more a G2 world, a confrontation between the real two superpowers. And basically they, they all tell us, make your choice on which side you are. And I agree, and that's a little bit the ideology of India during the bloc confrontation in the Cold War, the bloc-free nations. We should do our utmost, Europeans, Indians, uh, not to go into this polarization. Try to get rid of that as much as we can. But uh, I, I fear that the signals in the moment are going, are, are showing in exactly the other yes. direction. You're heading for energy cold war. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, other comments from the room? Last question or comments you would like to raise? No? We close here. I thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to have you all here. I think the conversation was very useful. And thank you to all the speakers and panelists. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>